So good evening, everybody. Again, welcome to Free to Heal. This is where we come together every week. Uh, formerly incarcerated, loved ones, children, stakeholders, people who have been affected by the criminal justice system and mass incarceration, trying to heal the wounds that were done to the individuals incarcerated, as well as their family members in our community. And so tonight's topic, we're going to talk about in light of the fact that this past Sunday was Father's Day, we're going to talk about what I call the father effect. Now, I apparently did this workshop at the Francisco Homes in 2015. Um, and I think this is the first time I've done it since then. One of the things I found out in doing that workshop was um, the impact of being fatherless. Um, a lot of men don't talk about it. And I got a lot of folks clammed up on, on, the, you know, on this topic. But so this is how it started off. Many people grow up without a father in the home. The effects can be wide ranging. There, there was a report that a prison staffer recognized that on Mother's Day, there were lots of cards and notes being sent to mother. On Father's Day, he had none. Uh-oh, I got... <laughs> Shut the motherfucking front door, y'all. My home that. girl that it. rolled up on a... <laughs> what? <laughs> Okay, wait, my board oh, president is calling. Sorry, y'all, hold on. Okay. Hey, Sean, I'm right in the middle of the group. I'm going to call you back, okay? I'll bring you. All right, okay, bye. Okay, so y'all just don't know. Okay, so this... Oh, God. This, this Ethel. <laughs> Ethel ain't no joke, y'all. Ethel. I, I see Ethel you have the whole many, crew many, there. Many, 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 many moons, okay? And Die, I met Die independently, but come to find out they was best friends. So it's been going on for years, but Ethel just rolled up on me, y'all. Now, wait, she crazy, so y'all got to be careful. I got to give y'all a disclaimer, right? Right now, we're going to talk about Ethel, the father effect, that a lot of five people grew up in a house without a father. You didn't have that experience. Your father was right there. He was crazy as all get out. Um, what I know about her father is he was always there, but he was always in his underwear. It didn't matter if it was Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Lionel and Lionel, Mr. Bradley, his name was Lionel, just like you. And he used to look, we didn't care. We already knew. First of all, if you come, <laughs> if you come in his house, you better be prepared to see, look at his damn underwear because he wasn't putting on no clothes for you. <laughs> The pint in the pocket, right. <laughs> Next to the under, it's in the pocket to the pants that's on the couch. But that's a whole nother story. Okay, but this is the thing. So, but the wide ranging effects of Ethel of growing up in a household without a father can, can change. They could be a lot of things. It could be devastating. It, it affects the way that we see the world and all kinds of things like that. So just, they talk about, the, the staffer talked about the fact that in prisons on Mother's Day, they see a lot of cards going out on um, Father's Day, they don't see so many cards going out. So now a lot of men, particularly in this circumstance, have done long periods of time and didn't have children. Wait, hold it, y'all, in the back. Oh, the peanut got, I'm sorry, we do it again. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, I just got okay. here. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's true. That's true. That's true. Like Rufus, Rufus, can you come get the people? Rufus, please come get the people. Rufus, Rufus. We, I need you to come get them. They misbehaving. All right. We need, I need a sergeant at arms to keep them quiet in the background while we trying to have a meeting here. I'm on my way. But Mr. Hall, he said you were so busy primping in the mirror that y'all couldn't get over here, but that's a whole nother story. We're going to talk about that later. We're going to talk about that later. <laughs> but anyway, so um, this alone leads to a very sensitive issue that men don't often talk about, and that's the father effect. The effect of not having a father. Um, and so I have a series of questions that I ask, um, that I'm asking. And one of them is, was your father in the home? So I need, I need, um, I need folks to jump in and tell me what the situation was, which because what I'm asking if 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 he was in the home, was it a good relationship? 
So you, you see how ain't nobody hurrying up, rushing to go answer the question? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm trying to tell y'all. And the last time I did, I'm gonna come right to you, Armando, because see, you you brave, right? And the mm -hmm. thing of it is, is that what I found is that when I did this in 2015, I had the same issue, trying to pull the conversation out of men about the effect of their fathers. I will also say that I saw Oprah did a show and she did it with fatherless uh, men. And one of the things that they said is that having growing up without a father leaves a hole in the size of the heart of the fatherless child, the size of the father. And so um, when, when that's not there, it's just, there's a certain, I was talking to a friend the other night and for example, okay, the three of us, we've been friends for a long time. She is always in charge. This one. Okay. Bully she bullies group. us. Bully she tell us what to do. That's the bully. But right well, we already know that. I know she's, su she's surprised, but we, <laughs> me and her, we not. Yeah, we so what I'm saying that to say is this, whenever we all get together, the dynamic in the room kicks in, whether we thinking about it, whether we don't, we already know FO in charge. Okay. And we just honor that. Well, that's what happens in families and in communities. It also happens in gangs, right? There's a hierarchy. There's a level of, there's a, there's just a way that people function. So when you start plucking people out of the equation, things start to sag in certain spots and you get a response to that. So when you start pulling fathers out of homes, grandfathers out of homes where fathers might've been missing, you wind up creating a dynamic that is, unhealthy for the community but Armando I want to come to you and let you answer those first two questions um what was the first question about the first question was your was your father in the home and the second one was if he was was the relationship a good one um I was blessed to have a mom and a dad growing up um I was born in 72 so I was born with a 70s generation dad you know a lot of uh sternness whoopings in the house you know um but in 1984 he turned, he, we were raised, he was alcoholic. Um, he was very abusive to my mom, verbal abuser, physical abuser. Um, but in 1984, everything changed when he became a heroin addict. So, you know, with that, he sold everything. As, as, as anybody's familiar with heroin addiction, you know, he sold every single thing. There was nothing he helped. So basically, he checked out. He started doing time of season. Um, and that's when I started running away. He started getting too much in the house. I didn't want to be there. He, when he'd go to jail, it would be like, wow, it's like, a, it was like, we were just all happy he was in prison, you know, the opposite. But um, when I, I don't blame him now going through the work, you know, I cannot blame dad. I, you cannot blame anybody. Um, but he had a very big impact on, on our lives when he turned to heroin and he basically checked out on us, started going to prison, started turning the house into a heroin house, you know, all kinds of people going to the house, living in the house and all that stuff. Um, I started smoking, uh, started drinking more and doing crack cocaine and started, started stealing with him and stuff. Even, you know, um, he was abusive, but when, 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 when that heroin addiction happened, that is when, my, cause you know, when you do the, all of us that have been down a minute, know that we've traced the causative factors back to our where we where we veered off to the to, to that other path and it was during that time that he turned to heroin and and basically checked out on us that I started turning into with the homies and running away and I started uh doing more crime and going to two camps YA life term sentence 30 years later back here he died in 2007 um hepatitis but I just want to say that I couldn't imagine without him. I, I, I love my dad. I couldn't, when he died, I couldn't even talk about him. I couldn't even tell stories without tearing up. I just I'd get all choked up. It took me years, literally. And even though we had that relationship um, that was abusive and, and, and all of those things, but I could talk about him now. Um, I, I like talking about my dad in the, in these classes you know, because I was fortunate to have him. At least I did have him, and I still have. I had love for him. I loved him, and you know, I know he loves me. But like my and, mom, and was, Armando, I hate to cut you off, but weren't you the one in a previous session 
that told us that it was when your parents started to get sober. Was it you? Because we there was somebody recently that was saying they were more upset with their parents when they started to get sober because they didn't they didn't like the change. Was that you or somebody else? No, it might have been somebody else. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted, but I because I, I that I, I, I that struck me was what was normal to them, what was what they were accustomed to changed because. Right. Hi. Oh no! It was no, it was no, it was a man. It was a man. It was a man. It was a man too. But um, because uh, Miss Tony, come over here, and get on camera, baby. Come over here so they can understand that that was you. Because what it was is that the um, is that the um, the relationship they no longer appreciated the relationship with the family, the parents, because they even though they have been drug addicts and all of that, what was normal. To them, that was normal, and then when it changed, they didn't know that. Uh oh, look, we got the peanut gallery and everything. Look, James. Okay, so look, conditioning. It's, okay, it's conditioning. I am very guilty of that. Very, very guilty of that. Very guilty of that. I apologize. But yes, no problem. No matter how bad it was, it was the conditioning of how that was. You know, it was like a fog lifted up, and my mom started asking questions every day, and I was like, "Shut up!" Okay, <laughs> you don't even <laughs> ask the kind of questions, huh? Yeah. And who are yeah. you to be getting in my business? You don't have it. Oh, I can only imagine, especially if they, if she hadn't been involved before, yeah. and now you're thinking, yeah. "Why are you asking oh. me this?" Yeah. yeah. Oh, another, no, even another, yeah. another thing. I wanted, I wanted to wait, say. Wait, wait, Armando's talking, y'all. Wait, go ahead. Another thing I wanted to say was, even though I did have my life, he was very indifferent. He 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 didn't uh he didn't you know hey what are you feeling like man what's up on your mind like what you know he he wasn't that kind of dad he was just remote alcoholic but when the heroin came it turned even worse but before that he was just a, like a distant man like alcoholic and he took us like to you know we'd go out and stuff like that sometimes but he wasn't that kind of dad that hey hey son what's on your mind son like talk to me. You know, I try to be that way with my kid. Like, hey, man, what's on your mind? You you know, if I hear him say, hey, cry, let that tears out, man. Don't hold back. Because my dad never told me, let it out, man. Don't hold it up. Because and, and then my mom, uh, you know, a, a lot of my uh, my insecurities came from him, too. Like, with the house, he'd always be like, don't be. Like, when my mom would try to tell us stories about, you know, when we were young and relatives, be, hey, don't be telling him that stuff. Don't be, don't be talking about, don't, don't be talking about family like that. He was real reserved, like. He didn't want us to know nothing about the family or nothing. And, you know, as you get older, you want to know all those questions. You want to know. And it's like fascinating when you when you hear about those family roots and grandpa used to do this or whatever. You know, you, you want to know those things later. But my dad, he, he was the opposite. And I caught myself being like that later, too, in life. Like, hey, don't don't be don't be don't be telling them that. And why are you telling them that information and that, you know, like but a lot a lot of your if we, if we did grow up with a dad, a lot of that can rub off on us, man, you know? A lot of that negative traits and, and stuff. And that, that is really, that. truly one of the things that um, one of the reasons why it's such a really good topic because, and it's not explored that much, but um, for example, one of the guys when I was at Solano in April talked about the fact that his father was abusive and he was a womanizer. And those were the characteristics that he got from his father that he picked up as a man as well. But he said he felt even a sense of guilt at that moment, right then as we were there, even saying anything that might make it seem like his father was a bad person because uh, he loves his father. It's like I, it's, it's like this love, but I know you weren't good for me, but I yeah. love you anyway kind of a thing. And he knew that the worst characteristics that he carried into his relationships, he got from his dad. But yeah. he said, I'm feeling even right now, I'm feel right now I'm feeling um um uncomfortable just saying anything that would give anybody a bad impression of my father because he's still my hero. And right. and you wanted to say something. Yeah, my relation with my dad, my dad was a big guy and he was a mean bastard. And uh, from the time I was seven. I used to tell him when I get big enough, I'm gonna kick your your fucking ass. And uh, when I finally got big enough, I didn't really want to. Yeah. But, but uh, 
I hated that dude when I was little, but when I was big enough to sit on a bar stool next to him, then we got along. Wow. <laughs> and and let me ask you this. So in those times, did you get next to a bar stool? Did y'all get to have conversations? Were there things because when you say you didn't you didn't want to anymore, does that was that because you understood him as a man versus just your dad, or you had more information, or just it just went away? It just went away. Okay. Because sometimes what happens is we have um, negative impressions of our parents, but that's because we're kids and we don't know what it takes to be an adult. And once yeah. you begin to learn, A, it's some things that go into being an adult, an adult, and therefore we can't be mad at everybody. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes the hurt parents, the parents we have were hurt in their in their childhood. Um, yeah. A lot of times um, abuse, and I see your, your hand, Armando, a lot of times the abuse comes down from the generation before, which was never stopped. And it, it, there was no chain broken right there. And that's what happened. Go ahead, Armando. Yeah, that cycle of abuse, it just goes on down. But I was going to say something else, too. Like, me and my dad got in fist fights, man. Mm. We got in fist fights and kicked out of apartments, breaking windows, all kind of drama. Because he, he would sell everything. But when he sold my BMX bike, oh, that was it, man. I went through a window. That's it. We, he had to take that fade behind that BMX, huh? I'm oh, so mad. Man. I but you know we got in fist fights and all that, but it's but when for a long time I didn't I didn't even trip off of it until you until I started doing this work, you know when you know the parole you know do this your causative factors find out your roots and all this stuff. I started really thinking like you know what a lot of this, but then again you don't want to blame though, so. I was like, oh, it's all him. But then I'm like, you can't blame. And I have forgiven him. I don't hold any grudges. I cannot do that. He's dead. I mean, I never got a chance to reconcile with him because my mom got married. You know, my mom met a new man and got married. I said, hey, man, mom has a new man. She can do what she wants to do. You had your chance. He took it as I was taking her side. He stopped writing me in 2007. Then he died. So we never got a chance to reconcile. I feel bad about that for a long time, but hey, I, I know that I'm going to see him in the resurrection. I'll, 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 I'll talk to him later. Right. You know? But you cannot hold on to that, to that grudge and that regret and that we guilt. We talked about That's that last thing. week, yeah. actually, Armando. We talked about that last week, that holding on to that grudge, no matter how much you think, how big you think the betrayal was, is like eating poison and hoping that the other person dies. Yeah. It, right. it, it's just pointless. It really is hurting you more than it's hurting anybody else. James, I saw your hand up in the back. Did you want to say something? You know, it's like, but I mean, I'm gonna need you to come so they can see you. So you're gonna have to come up here. I mean, how can you not see him? You, you know, know what you're <laughs> okay. Now, children, <laughs> I'm just going. I sit on your lap. Y'all just mm -hmm. don't know. Hi, Hello. baby. How you doing? Um, you know, it's like I didn't meet mom. My real father till I was eighteen. I want him. Y'all get an item in the summer so he can sit on. So I need him to. I need him to sit. Uh, up. He, he, he can sit, sit right down. there. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There you go. Now we. Now we. Cook I didn't, blue I blue didn't meet him until well. I was eighteen. And when I met him, he said something bad about my mother. And the first thing I did was put a three fifty seven magnum in front of him, and said the first one to get the gun would be the one that put roses on the other one's spray. So my uncle came in between us, and that's when it stopped. And for years. <laughs> Our conversations were real screwed up because he was a poor example of what a father was. My stepfather was who I had respect for with my behind every day. That man went to work every day. That man made sure bills were paid, food on the table. But my father, uh, he just passed about a year ago. Was a year? Yeah, about a year ago. And right before he passed, he told me, he said, man, I never hated your mother. I loved your mother. He said, I loved you, but I didn't know you. And I said, how can you love me and you don't know me? When I try to get to know you, you talk bad about my mother. I said, that's no way to get to know somebody. And then right after that, he caught COVID and he died. But then it's a, it's a point to where I had to release it because I started seeing the, the traits of my father in me with my kids. So now I just went to Lancaster, well, Palmdale, and made up with my son. And now I'm on this mission because my mission now is, last week we saw my forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I have to forgive me 
so I can forgive them. And then also so you could be free of the guilt of being gone for 26 years. Right. Because let's let's be clear, as fathers, particularly those of you that have been had children and been incarcerated for long periods of time, your children did pay a price for that. And there's a lot of guilt. I know it a lot with women in the prison um, in CIW. There was a huge amount of guilt. Um, and that's why there was a lot of suicide around the holidays, particularly um, Christmas and at November, the, the Thanksgiving, the Christmas holidays, there was a lot of suicides and suicide attempts because of the guilt of being incarcerated. But the one thing I say in these groups all the time, I don't know anybody who woke up in the morning and committed a crime that woke up that morning and said, well, I think I'm going to go on over here and rob this bar so that I can ruin my children's lives. Y'all didn't say that, that last part y'all didn't say. <laughs> they never thought they was going to come, so they, but it never occurred to them that they could literally go out in the morning and not come back to their kids for 20 some odd years. It never occurred to anybody. The, the lady I know in CIW that did 18 years for stealing $800 worth of clothes to support her crack habit. She never thought that when she went into Nordstrom's for, to steal $800 worth of clothes, she would be gone for 18 years and her kids would grow up without her. So nobody did that I know of. And listen, I know a lot of people committed crimes. It's just kind of the nature of my life, right? But I don't know anybody who has ever said to me, I woke up that morning, I said, yeah, I'm going to go ruin my family's life. Nobody, right? So again, and one of the things, so James, you're, no, I want to ask you. I was good at it. Uh, <laughs> right. He, he thought he was good at it. Like Diane said, thought he was going to get away with it. But let me ask you this. The, the fact that your biological father was not in your home, do you think it had an effect on the way that you viewed the world? Yeah. Okay. Because I thought that I was discarded trash. Ah. I never carried his name. I was happy. So I mm. thought I was discarded trash. All my buddies, um, their fathers would show up at the career days. And, you know what I'm saying? And their, their, their fathers was doing this and doing that with them. Here it is, I played football, and I was headed to my path was to college because of my mother and my stepfather. But then when I look up, I never saw my real father. I wanted to see the man that looked like me out there being proud of it, about his son and his abilities to play sports. You know what I'm saying? To play baseball, to play football. Uh, I played soccer. I did karate. All these things. But where was the man that looked like me? Mm -hmm. You know, I, my stepfather, man, I, I take my hat off to him twice. That man paid child support for me, and I wasn't even his natural blood son. Mm -hmm. Just to have visitation with me and my sister mm -hmm. when he divorced my mother. So, and, and today, he's still on that path. That's my son. He loved me unconditionally. And he was going to kick my real father's behind. You know, because he said, man, you missed out on the best years of your son's life. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, all three of us was together at one time. But then the thing is, did, I, did, it, did it have an effect? Yeah, it did. And see, and my thing is, I want you to understand, I want everybody to pay attention to what the effect was. It made him feel less than. You got to realize that that takes a toll on the self-esteem of a child when their parent is not there. So that makes it think, but you want to say something else, Mike? Yeah, well, he used to piss me off about my dad. He'd go to a friend's house and their kids would come up to him and he'd go in his pocket and give him a handful of change. That mother never gave me shit. Okay. You know? Well, yeah, see, and, and like you say, like Diane is saying, he was showing off. He was showing off, but oftentimes parents don't realize the impact of that. I need somebody else to talk to me. Somebody else. So thank you, um, Armando, for um for for giving us all that you know input and everything. Somebody somebody Jeremy. else had a hand. Sure. Yeah. Where's she at? I can't see her. She's right there. So you need to come up here, baby. Slide around. Slide around. Come up here. So you can talk to us. Yeah, sit in the hot seat. How about that? How about that? Okay. So you're saying about parents who aren't there. Let's talk about one 
who was the, that's what I'm saying, the parent father who was there. So I dated this guy and he used to fight me. Well, not fight me, but he beat me up. And the father said to him, son, if you got to fight the girls, why don't you take them to the beach where nobody could hear you? So for him to condone him, and I said, your father was a horrible person to even tell you that. He was absolutely horrible. And the boy had really, really messed up life because the mother was messed up because I figured that the father probably used to do stuff to her. But the mother was messed. She messed him up, too. And I kept saying to him after I got out of prison, I would talk to him. And I said to him, you must look like somebody that mm -hmm. your mother hates. And he looks just like his grandfather, who is the mother's father, who the mother hated because he was she was he was molesting her. The father, her father was molesting her. Mm -hmm. So, no and that's a thing because you can, um, you can be there, but you can't, you can be a detriment to them. You yes. Can be a real detriment if you're not the kind of father that a person needs. So, thank you. Yes. And sometimes, um, so I have some friends that I encourage to stay together. Don't run um, from my hot seat. And, um, and I actually, in hindsight now wish that I had not because they argued so much and said such horrible things to each other about each other in front of their children that I'm concerned that their children as adults now won't be able to have healthy relationships because the the concept of being nice to each other just talking to each other like they civil um instead of screaming and yelling on each other and constantly calling each other names and all this th that's what they grew up with where it might have been better had they separated and he just had to pick his kids up periodic, periodically. I don't know. That's abuse on a child. It is. It is. To subject a child to living in that it is definitely abuse. It's definitely abuse. And oftentimes people don't see it that way. My my sister. Uh-huh. When she married, because my mom and dad used to physically fight all the time. She told her husband, she says, you can only hit me once. She says, you don't get a second chance. Mm -hmm. And he did. He hit her one time, and she backed up, and the kid, and out the door. Mm -hmm. She And she told the second husband the same thing. You can put your foot through the, the TV if you want to, you know? But don't hit but, me. Yeah, you can punch the wall. Now, what I want to offer to you is this. <clears throat> um her response to all of that abuse and that violence in the household was one, one way and yours was something different, right? You responded to it differently, like in the fight and a bunch of all that stuff. That's how you responded to no, it. No, I didn't like when he, when he hit mama. But, no, 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 but, no. I said, but you like to fight. Yeah. You um, like to fight when you was a kid. Well, my dad told me to, he said, if I ever catch you from running from somebody, mm -hmm. He said the ass whooping you're gonna get from them ain't gonna be shit to what I'm gonna give you. Okay, now see, okay, now that's that's daddy in the household. Would anybody on this on this Zoom or in this room agree that that's a good thing to tell a kid? <laughs> it's not, okay? It's not. Because what it causes you to do is now you're so scared not to fight that you might take off first. You no, know what I'm saying? I get good at it. What, what, duh. Yeah, nah. yeah, duh. He got good at it because <laughs> it was either that or let the, the man that was tearing up his mama beat his behind. Come on now, let's be. So but what I'm saying is, is that your sister's response was, I will never let a man do that. Now, mind you, she didn't say he couldn't be verbally abusive. No. She didn't say he couldn't tear up the house. What she said is he can't hit me. Now, and I don't even know that that's healthy. I'm just talking about if we just really talking about the definition of what's healthy and verbal abuse is abuse no matter what it is. And so, Mr. Hall, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to pick on you today. Michael, Mr. Hall, I'm coming to you right now. I want you to talk to me. Answer the question. Here we go. Michael, yep, that's you. Come on. Go, Your Honor. <laughs> Talk to me. Uh huh. Yeah, you on the hot seat, boo. Come on. Hey, don't start. I'm already Where starting. Are you? Come on. What? What's the question? So, was your father in the home? Yes. Okay. Was it a good relationship? Nope. Okay. Um, how did how did you how do you think that affected you? Uh, it had a tremendous effect on me because uh, he was in the home, but. 
he he worked a lot, so we didn't really have a good as far as communication. Our communication was very bad. Uh, I didn't really learn nothing from him as far as do's and don'ts and uh, just how to be a man. Only way I learned that from him just uh, watching him. As far as talking to me about it, we really never had those conversations, and uh, it affected me. And what do you um, do? You have children, Michael? I don't know what. Don't remember what. You know. oh, okay, because I was wondering what would you do differently with your children? Like what, if anything, what would that look like? What would the difference be? Uh, the difference would be I would communicate with my uh, children. I would. Uh, tell them everything because I know that's that's important. I would listen to them, you know, see where their head is at uh, so I can understand them, uh, so I can build trust with them. Uh, but I understand that talking to your kids is very important, especially a man talking to his son. Because your mother, your mother can't, it's something she just can't tell you. We just you don't know. know. And those are things you ain't gonna, it's something you ain't gonna want to tell her. And if, if you don't have a man telling you this stuff, then you you trying to figure it out on your own. And that becomes very confusing to a, a kid. So one of the things, so James just said, and it started a, a conversation in the back. James said, a woman can't raise a man. And Pike said he disagrees. And I will say this, a woman can raise a man, but she can't tell a man how to be a man. Exactly. Yes. Um, yes. Well, and uh, I will tell you this. I will tell you his son is how he going how to be a man. Uh -huh. be uh oh, a man. uh oh, Cheryl sure came back to the hot seat, y'all. Come on. Well, hold up, hold up, swell up. Question about was my daddy in the house? Was your daddy in the house? Okay, only problem with ask, asking you to is we talking about the father fact. But go ahead. Was your daddy in the house? Yeah, he was. And was that a good relationship? No, it wasn't. He was an alcoholic. My mother used to beat him up. And I started to date older men because I needed a father figure. My son's father was 28 years older than me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, y'all heard that, didn't y'all? Oh, boy, here it comes. So, uh-oh, uh-oh, hot seat. We rotating. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Miss Tony. Since I walked in, I've been looking for this based on what I hear. You may want to forgive your parents. For raising you through their own unresolved trauma, for not being able to understand you because they didn't have the capacity to, for not being able to teach you certain skills as nobody taught them, being emotionally unavailable as their parents were emotionally unavailable, doing the best they could with what they knew and had, and following cultural norms that they were surrounded with and raising you through their own struggles, worries, pains, and fears. And I've just been holding on to this for quite some time because it just resonated on the things you, you have, all the critiques for your parents in whatever struggles that they put you through, but you don't always understand the struggles that they went through. And I, I you know, the book being on public display, I got the opportunity to see a lot of the struggles that my mother went through and I still have the ability to talk about them and talk about, you know, where I think things went wrong and where I think things happened here and there. And so, you know, sometimes as you go older, I think you just learn to have a little more grace for your parents because you yourself have gone through a certain amount of uh, things in your lifetime and, you know, just at work today. I think I said probably in five different conversations, no one is perfect. Mm. Right? That oh uh, uh Pike Pike Pike, just, Pike decided that he is perfect. So y'all know we're gonna ignore the fact that Pike said he was perfect. We just gonna keep right on moving along. We just gonna keep right on. We're gonna step right over that with Mr. Kane. Mr. Kane, go ahead, talk to me. Answer, answer the question. Uh first question is. Uh, uh, was your father in the home? He was uh, in the beginning, He, uh, but he was very physically and uh, emotionally, mentally abusive. And uh, when he started uh, his business, he was basically absent from my life. And then when I was in college, he decided to leave our family. 
And then uh, after many years, he came back. So I had a very, very difficult relationship with him. The strange thing was, is though, is uh, when I was young, after he would beat me, he would show me intense love, right? And so I started chasing that, you know? Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I started chasing that, that uh, well, I was always thinking that so when I get beat that it's somehow my fault and I'm chasing that love that uh yeah that he's uh he would give me so you know what's interesting you say that so I was when I went to yeah. Solano I met this pastor he was on a panel with me and he had me come on his podcast and there and there was a young lady that came to him and she was saying that she even though her spouse was very abusive, that she recognized that she became addicted to yeah. the ups and downs of yeah. the abuse. Yeah. And the pastor tried to tell her, no, 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 no. But it's like, no, you need to listen to what she's saying. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense to you or not, but yeah. because she was seeking the makeup, it was the highs and lows. It's the, the adrenaline yeah. rush, the, the, the chaos, even though it's chaos and she didn't like it per se, is what was familiar, but you can become addicted to the bad to get to the good. And that's a, a concept I've never really heard people talk about it a lot, but that's the truth though. And what you say resonates so loud with me that you can actually, even though you don't like what was going on prior to that and you didn't like the first part of it, if it meant that it got you to the part that you liked, which then you were seeking it out. One of the things that we know about children is children, if you don't give them positive attention, mm -hmm. they will take negative attention. However it goes, whatever I got to do. Well, another thing that it taught me, though, was is that, you know, when you even though you love someone, sometimes you can hurt them severely. So that's what I thought. I thought like, Hey, that's what relationships are about. People who love you can devastate you, but they could also lift you up. So, you know, it wasn't like I never saw those boundaries, in other words. Yeah. That's incredible. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Mr. Bradley, talk to me. Yeah. Uh, my father, he wasn't in the house, but he lived near. But uh, I had my stepfather who, who uh, basically kind of raised me too. But it's like uh, my stepfather, you know, he drank, smoked. And that's all the things I was like, you know, cussing. He did a lot of things I didn't like. I wasn't into. He wasn't, uh, he did what he did as a father. I love my stepfather too. I also love my real father. Even though, you know, I was plenty of years as I was up. My mother said, y'all, he's coming to pick us up. Come pick us up. To about 16, 15 years old, he never did. But once I turned 18, my mother told me, he said, even though your father was around, never came, they always broke his promises. Don't be like him. Go see your father. So at 18, I started going to see my father. And we built a relationship, and I ended up, kind of taking care of him in a way because he started begging me for money, begging me to do things. And then we we become tight. But I always told myself I'd never treat my kids the way he treated me. But at the same time, even though my stepfather was there in the house and doing providing for, you know, us and stuff like that. I didn't like the way how his father parenting went with me because uh that was something I would never raise my kids that way either. So I did go to the streets for looking for that love from uh, other guys like me was also looking for love in the street. And we became a gang, part of a gang, because it was there protecting one another. And then again, the it was like, uh, I can't blame the gang for how the, the negative shit I was doing because, you know, they was going through the same thing. And so I'm much to blame the Zim as I blame, you know, the gang and stuff. But when it comes to my father and stuff, you know, I loved him when he passed. I still, you know, shed a tear for him. That's about it. You know, shed a tear. And uh, 
I cuss them out still in death. I cuss all both of them out still in death because I didn't agree. I was at a point I started taking care of other people's kids. I started raising other people's kids the way I had wanted to be raised. I started being that was your response. So listen to this. That's interesting too. That was your response to to not having the kind of father that you wanted. Was you began to try to do that for other people's kids, and that yeah, was your yeah, I was very to protective. It. Yeah, yeah, and that right there is still goes on today. Is trying to be there for others, you know, helping them and trying to get my people to come together as a tribe, as better people. And that's some, you know, I won't turn my back on because I wouldn't feel bad. I wouldn't feel good about myself if I turned my back on someone, a child in need and stuff like that. I would try to be there if I could. And so as far as parents, we, there's no parent, but because if you look at back in the past, our parents, the slavery days was treated way trauma, way bad. And so they were snatched from their parents as kids sold off and all these other abuse went on with our parents. So we went generation after generation. This right here went on that I feel that, you know, how we use how our tribe used to raise the kids as a as a tribe, as a whole. I remember uh growing up, the older people on the streets used to whoop the other kids when they do something bad because they're being a family, uh like a parent to them when the mothers be at work or something. And they're like my mother, strong woman. You know, all the boys looked at her, looked at her for for guidance. When something went on negative, she was there to fight with us. My stepfather wasn't there to fight with us, and my father wasn't. Father was soft, you know, but yeah, but my mother was that strong person, just like every strong man needs that strong woman. My mother was a strong woman for all the boys. And so your father, me. your natural father was close by, and you got to go see him. While you were well, no, up. he he never he never he he never. When I turned eighteen years old, that's when I went to see him. He never came to see me. So basically, you know, your whole, your whole childhood really you didn't have him there. You no, I didn't have him father. there, but I, I saw him. I saw my real father every now and then. But okay. my stepfather was there for me, was there all the time. But he wasn't that father figure that I wanted in my life. Got you. You know, he was abusive and stuff like that with the words, drinking and stuff like that. You know, there's certain things I didn't like in him, but with certain good qualities about him at the same time. So I can't take that away from my stepfather because at least he tried. Mm -hmm. He was it's there. like, you know, like I said, yeah, ain't nobody perfect. And no, nobody have a, a book to holler raise children. They do the best they can. No, they don't come with a, a manual. Of color. Yeah, especially for a person of color. There's so much we have to deal with, you know, outside the family just to make it home and stuff like that after going to work or being in the streets. We go through a lot as people of color. So therefore, I can't blame them for what they went through, how they treated me. Only thing I can do is try to make myself better, prepare right. myself and try to help others. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I love my stepfather. I still love my father. But that wasn't the way... I would have raised my kids the way they raised me. Mm -hmm. you know? Patrick, so, China, just so happened. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you it off. Just so, just so happened, I ended up going to prison for 30 some years. So, in the long run, I ended up abandoning my kids the way my father abandoned me. By mm -hmm. me going to prison, I wasn't there for them. Like, I wanted my father to be there for me. You know? yeah. And so, let me ask you this then, since you said that. Um, what has it been like uh, since you've been home trying to repair that that breach? Well, they my 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 kids were raised in a certain way that a man supposed to provide and give them all the things they want financially, protecting them all that. No, I can't do that. You know, they they in their thirties now. I can't give them the things they want me to give them. The the luxury thing. I can't be there to fight their battles with their boyfriend. That's the police job. You call the police. You don't call me. You know, I get out of prison and go do some violent act towards another human being because I know myself and so I know my triggers. I can't be around that type of stuff because if I snap and something trigger me, you go back to prison. I go all out. No, I'm not going to prison. It's going to be a. I'm not going to prison because I know the consequences behind prison. I wouldn't get out again. So, therefore, 
it's, 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 you know, yeah, I, I can't, I just to step over that line because I know the consequences behind my actions. I'm not going, I try to avoid all this. It's like I drive down, up and down the street, this road rage. I'm not going to buy you the road rage because I know me. that past have a good day and smile. I make excuse for these people. They must be in a hurry, emergency, some of you going on. See, I go through life trying to find positive things within the negative things of life. So, yeah, I'm not going to prison. Right, but I was just saying, you know that there's some things you can't do. But Patrick, go ahead and um, and uh, chime in on the topic. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought up the attention that a child wants or needs, whether it's positive or negative. My dad died when I was 10, and that's when my mom became an alcoholic. And even if you had bad attention or good attention, and it was 50-50, a child doesn't know any better. All a child wants is the attention. Mm -hmm. So you put up with the bad to get the good. So like, you know, when there's abuse and then there's love, you don't think about that when you're 10 years old or 12 years old or 15. You just want the interaction. You want the attention. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're all affected by. And again, it's another form of trauma. But let me ask you this, because you're the circumstance of your father not being there was for him to have died. Do you, how, how, how different do you think that was versus him being alive and not being, and just not being there? Do you think it would have been different? It would have been different just because of the interaction, whether uh, he was actually there to help or not there. He was in the military. So from time to time, he was gone anyway as part of his normal job. So a child gets used to that. He's there for six months and then he's gone for six months. And during the Korean War, he was gone for a whole year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that you don't understand as a little kid either. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you add the other stuff in there. And I was fortunate. My mom and dad loved each other. So there was an abuse. And then, you know, for me, there was abuse through abandonment or abuse through uh my mom's alcoholism and that you don't understand now we realize it's a disease and it's psychological back then you just thought it was a willpower thing and people were doing it because they wanted to people didn't have a choice sometimes yeah certainly once it becomes an addiction it certainly takes over and it takes the you know the i mean it's more than just something that i want you know it, it and addictions consume everything well, that's what it was interesting. You brought up the fact about the addiction of the attention. That became an addiction. You wanted the interaction with an adult figure. And sometimes it might be, in my case, my mother, or it might be a relative that was uh, a parent figure. Mm -hmm. and, and you want that interaction. So that becomes an addiction. Wow, that's 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 powerful. Thank you. Um, what do you want to say? You know... I never wanted to have kids. Not only I knew I was going back to prison all the time, but knowing I was kind of like my father, mm -hmm. and I never thought he was a good father. So You didn't want to continue that? I didn't want to continue that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know. and, and people often make that choice, uh, consciously make that choice not to have children because of the way that they were raised. Um, Oscar, is there anything you want to add to the conversation? You have to unmute, sir. Unmute. Wait one second. Unmute because we can't hear you. Stop early. Try it again. Up and down. Unmute. You see the microphone? You can't unmute it. I'm going to click this and maybe it'll give you something to. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, when you when you get a chance, when you figure out how to unmute it, just go ahead and chime in, okay? Hi, Noreen. It's Terry. Yes. So can I can hear you now. Good. I fixed the problem. Anyways, what you guys are all talking about is like a chain effect. 
You know, you start with your father, the grandparents, then their grandparents, and their father, and their father, and so on. It's like a chain. If your if your grandpa is drinking and going out and honky tonking around, you know, and and he and he comes home and your kids see all that, then you're going to go right along with it. It's just it's a, it's a parent showing another child to another child how he's growing up. You know, my went to the bars, mom, and it just trickled down to where. I started doing the same thing, getting drunk, going to bars, and having a good time. And honky talking around. You was honky talking around, Otis, because you know that that was a doozy right there, baby. That was baby. We love it. That I gotta write that down. We was honky talking around. That was a technical term, no less, huh? Yeah, back in the fifties, it was, you know, fifties. <laughs> I can't hear you. They over here laughing so hard. <laughs> they laughing so hard. I can't even hear you talking. Wait, wait. Let the peanut gallery quiet down. It's like a trickle uh, effect. Uh, you're going to go along with everything your parents do. You're going to do. You. And then you're going to see your uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, and everybody else doing the same thing. Yes, so you will. It's just a it's a terrible thing to see. It does pass down from generation to generation. The trauma perpetuates itself each generation. Um, because that's the way it is. Oh, but I see Oscar, you were able to unmute. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? I sure can. All right, good. Yeah, I was just checking. Well, uh when I born, my father abandoned me and my mom. It was hard for me because she was a single mom with five kids. He, when when he abandoned my family, uh, he my mom became a alcoholic. She started drinking, and she started being aggressive in front of us. He, my brother take care of me, but he was abused verbally and physical. Like two years later, she my mom decided to send to me with my aunt. And my aunt do the same thing. She abused me uh, physical and verbally. And she don't like when I go to play with kids. Every time I see the kid, affect me very bad because every time I see the kid, they have their family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. They got toys. They, yeah. they celebrate birthday. They buy give for them, they buy a clothes, they give you everything, they take to the park, to the movie theater, everywhere. I don't want nobody around me. Yeah. I feel abandoned from my father and my mom. Yeah. This affects me because I start to get uh, really mad, really aggressive, really angry person, really selfish, because when I see the little boy have a toy, they play, they don't want me to play with them because I don't have no, they always told me, oh, you cannot play with that because you don't have no father. You don't have no toys. Mm. I started to get mad and I started to destroy their toys. Uh, That's right. You won't let me play with my, tear your shit up. How about that? Now, I won't play and neither will you, right? That's the, yeah. that, that's the mind of a child, though. Literally. A kid will do that. Oh, if you're not going, I watched my granddaughter do it, in fact, the other day. Her little cousin, she was playing with the Lego blocks. And her little cousin um, wanted the same block she was playing with. And so my my granddaughter didn't want to give it to her. And her cousin went and just knocked the whole thing down and walked past it. So she's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you don't want to play? You don't want to let me play? Well, you won't have it either. But wait, but this, this is my granddaughter, though. It don't matter because I'm going to build that shit back up again. And you're still not playing with it. But that's what kids do. Literally, that is the response. Oh, you you don't want me to play with it? Well, guess what? You won't play with it either. And see, that kind of aggression is rooted in things like that. And that pain that you experience and express just now can go so deep, which is, again, why this conversation, I, I did this once in 2015, and I haven't touched it until today again all these years later. Because it's very deep. So for me... 
my father effect, and I wrote about it in my book, was my father, somebody mentioned the term a, a little while ago, emotionally unavailable. My father wasn't, he, my father um, lived around the corner. Him and my mom separated. I don't remember them ever living together in my lifetime. But he lived around the corner. It was in walking distance. My earliest memories of him are in him in rehab for heroin addiction. It was one of the first, it was the first state sponsored inpatient rehab facility in the state of Pennsylvania. And my father was in this program and we went to go see him. And my grandmother said, well, you know, your father's sick, so we need you to be on your best behavior. But when I saw him, he looked the same. He didn't look like nothing wasn't wrong with him. Uh, you know, he had on some hospital clothes, but he still walked me on his shoes like he always did, threw me up in the air. Him and my grandfather then played Pinochle. You know, he watched us roll down the hill. Everything seemed normal to me, but I guess in my mind as a child, it meant that no matter what I needed from him, since I hadn't seen him, it didn't matter. I had to not worry about what I needed and worry about what he needed. And so then that's okay for your dad. But when you do that with the man in your life, okay, you're going to wind up getting your feelings hurt. And somehow you're going to be left out of the equation about being taken care of in a relationship. And so I had to learn. And then I realized years later that I actually attracted to the emotionally unavailable man. You know, they had that term for it, the strong, silent type. That's some bullshit. That just means that he is not able to communicate very well. And so miss me with that. You, shit. Okay. He talking, about, he talking about he the strong, silent type. He talking about that ain't true. The fact the fact that they protested so loudly, let me know that both one of them, they both that kind of dude, okay? And I'm just telling y'all, I'm calling them out right here, right now. I'm calling they out. Okay. Okay. Get out, Noreen. Bye. Okay, take care. I was now I can make it. Come back to you. She talked to you, goddamn. I turned the music up when a girl gets my car. I make sure I got a lot of speakers. A lot of speakers? Yep. And cut the music up. But we ain't supposed to have no talk. We're not supposed yeah. to talk. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't talk. No. Not... Uh -huh. Oh. So he's not unavailable. Yeah. The strong silent type was emotionally available. I said I'm the strong silent type. Okay. <laughs> he's the strong silent type. Yeah. Unavailable. No. And it... <laughs> okay. The fight is on. Of course, you gotta have. It's on in here. Oh, 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 he never had no emotion to begin with. Okay, that's the I distinction, y'all. The emotion part of the relationship. Oh, that there was supposed to be some. I never saw my mother and my father <laughs> hold hands. I never saw my mother and my, my father come in from work, go and get a uh, uh, slip my liquor bull, the blue bull, and he going in, he got a t shirt. And my mom come in there, she put a TV tray in front of him. He ate dinner, took a shower, went to bed. Yo, start all over the next day. Start That's all over. So, I.E. And, and translation, was, translation. Was, what was the translation, Tony? That was the strong emotion. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now, what's your story, Mr. Terrell? Right. Yeah. See, because you over, you've been awfully quiet. He been awfully quiet all day. Yeah, buddy. What's well, happening? <laughs> we want to hear this. No, I just, I just want to say this. It's, uh, it's genetically pulled in. I mean, it's in your genetics, but if you grow up with that and it's continued to be triggering, it's it's like you don't know why you are, but your dad know, your mom know, because they know the the, the they know the, the lineage, they know the lineage of what you are, but you don't know that. And then if you 
a, that part of you gets triggered as a kid or you see that and you're traumatized by it, you really don't know because you don't know yourself more than your parents know. But those genetics get get passed down, you know, just like the just like the mental, the mental illnesses, the the the, the chemical effects, all of that shit gets passed to your genetic. And the trauma that you go through, it, it makes you who you are. And as far as uh the silent, say the silent strong name, silent type, I'm emotionally strong, unavailable. Type. I'm the strong silent type and, and emotionally I'm, unavailable. No, I'm I'm very emotionally available. I just be thinking about my next move. Because when I get silent, I'm I'm a thinker, so I think mm -hmm. outside the box. So it's not that I'm not, uh, detached emotionally, because I'm very attached mostly. I know certain things, and I've always been like that. So, you know, even when my dad was alive, he's like, you're a better father than me, because I already knew how he was with me. I know he didn't teach me shit, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? And he was in the house till I was seven years old. My, my uncle taught me how to be a man, how to be a father, how to be a family man, all that shit. So I just knew I had to be different than my dad. You but I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you right here and right now. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because let me say this. Because let me say this. Wait, 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 wait. Right to you. But this is what I want to say. You also are the one who refuses to get involved in an emotional relationship with anybody because you don't feel like you're ready to do that right now. So either so so that is emotionally unavailable, no, is no, it no. not? It's, it's not that I'm not ready to be emotionally involved. It's, it's the fact that I I just got off paper. So for one, if I'm goddamn government property, I ain't even my own property. So I don't feel holding myself to give nobody more of me than what I am have myself. So now I'm I have my um, uh, the, have uh, my uh, all the peanut galleries still I say have, like, emotionally I unavailable. We still. Cause it's a lot of bullshit out here. <laughs> now we so no, translation, translation, emotionally. Hey, hold it, hold it, y'all. Cause look, this the thing. Whether no matter how he want to fix it, twist it, he ain't. He don't. He don't want to be invo involved emotionally. Okay. That is part of it. And listen, and listen, and Terrell communicates fairly well. Terrell wrote a whole book. Okay? I've talked to Terrell. We talk for hours. We can talk on a whole lot of subjects. But that has nothing to do with intimate relationships and they're willing to be emotionally available and involved with a woman. It, uh, it has nothing to do with that. And that's what I'm talking about is the effect that my father being emotionally available had on me in my choice in relationships. And look, Terrell, my type. But guess what? It ain't happening. He might have, he he might have a little sugar in there. <laughs> Did y'all hear what Pike said? Did y'all hear Pike? <laughs> we, oh, I'm so glad y'all didn't hear Pike because... Okay, no, but I gotta tell y'all. I'm gonna tell y'all. I'm gonna tell y'all this. Wait, 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 no, no, wait, wait, wait. Hey, lucky I don't beat up old men. I got a nice shoe. But Pike said he, Pike said he might have sugar in his tank. Pike told him that he might have sugar in his tank, y'all. Y'all know that is so offensive, right? So that's why. Pike said, Pike, so listen, that's why he, he lucky that Terrell don't beat up old men no more, y'all. I'm just telling y'all, y'all don't know what I go through over here. It is something else. But I just want to say to y'all, I honestly though, but seriously, go ahead, baby. No, but for real, on some real stuff though, I mean, it's 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 in us. But the thing about it, we have to change that 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 negative connotation and the negative genetic that's that's instilled in us as fathers. Uh, I talked to my son on a regular, uh, something that my dad didn't do to me and something I learned from others as well. But it's okay to vent to your your, your, your kid. I mean, I mean, you guys been going a long time, so it's a different ball game, but you got to let allow your child to allow you that space. You can't just barge into you that space. You can't demand it. You can't demand it. You got to give them time because it's their life. You know, you we've been going out their life, so... We got to give them the, the opportunity to say, 
you know, to, to allow us in a space. You know what I'm saying? And then when they allow us in, our, in a space, give them an earful. Get them what you feel. Let them know how you feel for real because they gonna know bullshit from, from some real shit and they gonna feel it. They might not agree with it, but they gonna hear you and they gonna feel it if it's genuine. And you know, one you said that before. You've said multiple times in our groups that when your children begin to come at you and they say things, you just gotta take it. And yeah, that's important. Yeah. You got to take it and you got to let them get it off their chest, whether you like what they're saying or not. What you have to do is you have to allow them to express those things. Yes, sir. I have I, I have seven children. I have two girls and five boys. The hardest thing when I came home was to sit down with my children and put myself in the house. And whatever they said, and however they expressed it, I had to take it. And it's not just one time. I gave them multiple times. And there's constantly, we're constantly replenishing, we're constantly purging what they're feeling because a lot of them don't understand what they were feeling at that time. And it may come up later in our conversations. That's why I tell you gentlemen, when we were talking about being emotionally unavailable, first thing I tell a, a, a person coming out of prison is date yourself before you try to date somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because first you got to find out who you are because you can't be good to nobody else if you don't know who you are. But then like, I didn't find out I liked it uh, uh, combination egg rolls until last week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I did Right. I walked in my first day out of prison. I walked to Walmart. I saw the different kind of deodorants. And you know, I cried because I didn't know what deodorant I liked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't. There was too and many then choices. The toothpaste, the, the a bag of chips, holding money, holding keys, all them things were an issue for me. But my children were my biggest, not hurdle. But my biggest uh, 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 awakening, because my daughters, college educated, my sons are too, and they all had these words. And I'm looking at these grown people that when I left 26 and a half years ago, they was little bitties. Now I'm looking at grown people with their own little bitties. Yeah, but you and know, each, you know. When, when you, no, hold on, hold on a second. You know when you you go into prison, yeah. When you're young and you do all that time, mm -hmm. you're you're not even close to the person you was when you went in. No, no, that's for sure. No. You know what I'm no. saying? Because I, have, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I'm just saying that that when when you go in like. And you start, and, and you have to do the bullshit and all yeah. that. But when you come out after, you know, 30-something years, you're not even close to the person you was when you went in. And no. neither are your yeah. children. Neither, and in, your children. neither, in his case, oh, in 26 no. years, neither were his children the people they were when he went in. And so these, these things create dynamics, and they create scars that because there's a sense, I'm sure they felt abandoned. They they, they was abandoned. They felt rejected. Uh, my daughters felt like they wasn't um, they wasn't protected. Not protected, but they didn't deserve to be loved mm -hmm. the way they were seeing like a Hallmark movies. And the love and the, the, the things. Yeah. That, that the, you know, because that's what they're looking at. Yeah, Little girls good. look at these Hallmark movies and they want the two and a half kids and the Pick and pick fans, fans, yes. I'll skip the this. dog. I'll skip the dog. Yeah, we don't skip the mutt, but you know, my daughters, I want they, the dog. They, they, we are the dog. Um, <laughs> they brought it home, but the, but my daughters were real verbal about. They said my letters were beautiful, my book beautiful, but. It was the hug that they needed when the boogeyman was there. Yeah, yeah. It was the, it was the, my daughter want to get pregnant again. 
because she wants me to be in her house to go through the pregnancy. And she had four girls. And she was like, Daddy, I want to go through it so my daddy can hold me on them nights when I wanted to be held. And I wanted my daddy to talk to when I needed to talk to my daddy. Those are the times that we miss that a lot of kids that's turned into adults are scared to even verbalize to us yes. because they don't know who we are. Yes. Our mothers have made us out as the boogeyman. The system has made us out to be the boogeyman. We have made ourselves out to be the boogeyman. Until they get to know you, and until you get to know yourself, you are still the boogeyman. We have been through the self-help groups. Not and them. if you took it serious, you, you, you've been through them, you heard, you figured out where you went wrong, the broken chain and offense or whatever. But when we come home, they have never been in a psychological group. They have never seen the, uh, uh, did nobody take their kids down in, in a big brother's shelter and say they need a big brother. But the big brother is not their father. It's not their dad. It's not that hero that was there when they was born that held them, that they listened to their heart. Those are the times that we miss. Those are the times that they miss. Those are the times that they still cry about. That you can't get back either. And you, you can't, can't don't try and to look, go back. And listen, tell your daughter forward. don't tell your daughter don't have none, none of one of them hard heads trying to recreate that moment, honey. Let oh, no. just let just let you hug her now. <laughs> Cause look, them kids is way too much work. No, she, it's she getting, got married to a woman. Okay, so it's getting, oh Lord, okay. See, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Okay, what? so what we're gonna do is, I, I want to give everybody a chance. I'm gonna start in the room and allow everybody to have their final comments on the topic. Cause we're we're, we're getting uh, it's seven thirty. I want to give us an opportunity, and then I'm gonna check out with you guys that are on Zoom. I want to start in the back, back here, um, darling. I enjoyed the uh, topic for today, especially with Miss Tony read on her phone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate being here. <laughs> Darling, any last comments back there from you? <laughs> yeah, you guys have to, um, like they're saying in totality of all of this, you have to understand that our parents, a long time ago, just like the guy that I said that you speak me up and the daddy said the stuff. The mother's 97, she was in Mississippi. I'm sure her uncles, her cousins and all the men were having sex with her when she was a young girl because she did horrible things to her son. Yeah. But just always think back to what, we don't think about how jacked up their lives were, but they lived in slave, they came out of slavery and a whole bunch of stuff. So their stuff is behavior just like we were incarcerated and we came out with the behavior. Thank you. Hey, y'all know my motto, bro. Uh, figure it out every day, one day at a time. And don't be too hard on yourself. Date you before you try to date someone else. Thank you. Isn't that what's real? <laughs> mm -hmm. Hell yeah, I'm dating <laughs> As you should. I figured out. I'm just gonna tell you guys, um, <clears throat> just be a better father than your father was to you, and um, just do your best. Do your best because there ain't no rules to this shit. Ain't no no blueprint. No manual. <laughs> just, just just be a, a, a the best father that you could be, you know, and 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 try to have a good communication style with your children, no matter how old they are. Thank you. Any comments from you? Nice to meet you guys. I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to do mine and just say, you know, I'm so grateful for you guys to have this conversation. Uh, nah, you passed me. Go. No. Yeah. I have a fine time with your children. All right. Okay. <laughs> and so we got some, and he didn't even cuss at us, y'all. We did good. We did good. We did good. So um, I want to ask um, uh, Armando. Okay, we're gonna let the people online check out now, so y'all y'all gotta be able to hear Armando. Check out any 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 highlights from the night. Any last comments? Yeah, lots of good highlights. It was very insightful. Also about uh, what Tony and Cheryl had mentioned about knowing where your family came from. You no, know, before you start pointing at them, understand that parents came from some, some BS, came from some trauma also. And then it's just being passed down to us. But with our, we should be able to break that cycle. 
You know, yeah, because because you know what? Because we have done all these self help groups and all of these things, we should be passing that along you know to the next generation. Right? When you know better, you do better. You said it right, uh, yeah. Mr. Kang. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, this was my first group uh, outside of prison, and I really enjoyed everyone's comments, and uh, I had a really uh, insightful time. Thank you. Well, and thank you for your contributions too, because. Um, the idea of becoming addicted to that abuse to get to the loving part is powerful. And a lot of people don't realize that they have that kind of addiction. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Rufus, last uh, comment for you. I, appre I appreciate the, uh, the, the, the topic and the conversation. And I like what Terrell said, you know, because I never knew my dad, never met him, you know, never laid eyes on him. So, you know, uh, and, and I understand the impact of my life because he wasn't there, you know what I mean? Um, so, like Terrell said, you know, I subscribe to what he said in terms of um, be be a better father than than than, than my father was. Wonderful. You know, so, and that's where I'm at in my life Thank with you. my kids. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, this topic, Marine, um, it was much needed, especially for, uh, for uh, those countries out there that don't have a father. We need to have these conversations because it is important. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's painful. It's very touchy. You know, it's, it's very painful. It goes into very deep, hurtful places for people. Um, but we need to touch those places, thank you, so that we can begin to heal those wounds that are there. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bradley. Yeah, uh, James hit, hit a key point for me when he said about the groups, and that's something I did, a lot of groups, and there's a lot of things they don't understand now that I understand, and I got to say, you know, now follow your heart. Listen, share with them, and, you know, listen to them, and, you know, sometimes you got to just explain what's going on, your emotion, your feelings, and don't be ashamed of being open and uh, honest with them, and, and share the tears, because... They want to see that that you feel that pain that they went through too. And Absolutely. So that's what I take with you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And Oscar, last but certainly not least. No, so okay. You I, already. I just want to say I'm sorry for my tears, but every time I talk about my dad, always my tears come out. You better uh, not apologize for them tears. I'm going to be mad if you apologize. That's the whole point <laughs> is for you to understand what this is. And this is the safe space. Let that out. Don't hold on to that. Thank you. You're Thank freed you. to heal over here with us. Da, da, right. da, 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 da. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much for everything. Again, this is Freed to Heal. We had another wonderful session. I want to thank you guys on YouTube. Check us out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all social media. And we'll see you guys next week. And if we can get Mr. Hall to stop primping a little bit earlier, maybe he'll actually be in the house with us next week. <laughs> Love you guys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>